Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of the need for the, the statements and, and the need for the development of rightstatements.org from the DPLA perspective as well as a little bit about Europeana. So um, here's the basic outline for my slides. I'm going to talk about the DPLA network. Um, for those of you who don't know about it, because this is a general open webinar, so there's probably um, some folks on the webinar who are not necessarily a part of the DPLA network, and we certainly welcome you today. Um, and so I'll give her just a, a brief overview about the network, um, talk about the need for the statements themselves, a little bit about uh, a previous framework built by our colleagues over in Europe, and um, then uh, just touch on the launch of rightstatements.org and what those implementation possibilities are for DPLA. We'll do a much deeper dive into um, implementation um, during the second webinar, but this is just kind of um, the, scratching the surface a little bit around possibilities. So this is a graphic of the DPLA network. Um, the orange dots here represent service hubs. So the service hubs are um, geographic in nature, so uh, typically state-based, maybe regional-based, where um, the gray dots here represent individual institutions that contribute to those hubs. Um, so they might be um, individual institutions within a state that contribute to a centralized aggregation. Um, where the yellow dots here represent content hubs, so there are inst individual institutions that contribute to DPLA on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, here are some of the um, overall, uh, some of the projects that you may know throughout the country that are participating um, in DPLA. Um, many, many state-based aggregations you'll see here, as well as um, some large individual institutions that would represent those yellow dots, those content hubs. For example, uh, the National Archives and um, Greg Cram's institution, the New York Public Library, they both contribute to us as content hubs. So right now, this is what our current map looks like where our hubs are located throughout the country. Um, so you'll see that uh, in either in orange or in kind of, you'll see in the Mountain West region, in kind of a burnt orange color, um, we have um, service hubs represented. And then in the, the navy color, those are uh, hubs in active development. So those are hubs that are uh, preparing their data to go live in DPLA already. They've already sent in an application, and that application has been accepted, and they have um, moved from, you know, thinking about becoming a hub to actually becoming a hub and sharing their data with DPLA. Uh, just like in the previous diagram, the yellow circles here represent the content hubs throughout the country. So you'll see many of those uh, located in DC, some of those large institutions I'm talking about, but as well as the smattering of others throughout the country. Uh, what's not reflected here is activity that is going on in states um, that have not um, submitted an application as of yet or have not actually had an application approved. We actually have two current applications that are under review from, from states not represented on this map, but there's a lot of activity going on throughout the country um, in, in states um, that, that are still gray on this map, but um, hopefully soon we'll turn those states navy and then eventually orange. So a little bit about the Digital Public Library of America. Uh, right now we have over 13 million records. Um, those are aggregated from all of those institutions throughout the country, those different hubs. We have 28 different hubs and eight in currently in development. We have over 1,900 contributing institutions. So when I showed you that initial diagram with the orange circle with the gray institutions that contribute to those aggregations, that's really where um, that, that contributing institution number is coming from. So, um, so for example, in North Carolina, um, it's a state with about 200 institutions participating across the state, different kinds of cultural heritage institutions, very small um, public libraries, historical societies, and others contributing data um, across that state. Um, another, another state very similar to that is, is Minnesota, where there are over 200 institutions also participating. Um, 
We have nine major metadata schemas represented in the DPLA, and not all of those are XML-based. Um, it is, uh, a, people often ask us, well, what kind of metadata do you take? And the answer is, we take a lot of metadata, and we, um, we map that metadata to the metadata application profile at DPLA. Um, our metadata application profile um, requires only a few um, fields to be filled out, but one of them is a right statement, and that's the area we're going to focus on talking about today. Um, that right statement field, um, we we certainly have a lot a lot of variety, and I'm going to show you um, some of what I mean by that. Um, we actually have close to probably um, if we extrapolate some of the some of the early um, number work we did, we probably have close to a hundred thousand different kinds of right statements in the Digital Public Library of America. Um, and and one of the things that I actually think is is pretty. Um, Pretty telling and, and a tad bit funny is that there are more words in the right statements field than there are in any other field in uh, our metadata records, and that includes description. So we have a lot to say about rights um, or to say about something that we put in the right statements field, whether it's about rights or not. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, this is a visualization um, done by Dean Farrell at the University of North Carolina, um, and he took a, a sample of 1.3 million records in the DPLA, and he was able to kind of put them in various categories. So in the top left corner, you'll see um, in the dark orange, those represent Creative Commons license. So we have a small amount of um, records that actually have Creative Commons license in the Digital Public Library of America. In the, um, in the lighter colored orange, you'll actually see those are actually copyrighted. Those are clear copyright statements that this item is protected by copyright. In the light blue, you'll actually see public domain or not in copyright statements. And in the dark blue, um, those are statements that are ambiguous. We're not really sure exactly what those statements um, tell us. Um, they often tell us, they're often more generic statements. Um, you certainly may have, have produced some of those. Um, I know that, that many of our institutions have in the past produced a, a fairly generic right statement, and um, there are quite a few of them in the DPLA. Um, this is just another breakdown of the current DPLA right statements. This again was also done with only 1.3 million records, so um, a uh, about 10% of what's in the DPLA. Um, and most of the statements um, had a copyright or an all rights reserve statement um, on the records at 45% of the records. Um, 25% fell into that other category, so when I told you that we couldn't really figure out the right status, there were more generic statements, about 25% of those right statements fall into that. So between those two, that represents you know, uh, the majority of the statements that you find in the DPLA right now. Is it, it, Things are listed as in copyright or there is more of a generic statement, and it's hard to actually figure out what a right status is. Um, for that statement. 8% um, are identified as government documents. Um, not necessarily are they identified as public domain, but they're identified as government documents. 7% um, missing a right statement. So again, I told you that was a required field that said um, some things have fall through the cracks um, during the process, and so about 7% of what's there is missing a statement. 7% um, also has kind of um, a phrase that we're, we'll, we'll often see, and I'll show you an example as I go through my slides, but kind of this digital image copyright, um, basically when we've digitized a material, um, we, we've put a statement on it that says um, that, it get, that it's got a new copyright as of the date that we scanned it. So it might say this digital co image copyright 2012, 2013, whenever it was digitized. Um, and then um, we have fi only 5% identified as public domain and 3% having a Creative Commons license. So um, 
I told you I'd uh, kind of show you an example, a little bit of some of the some of the things in the DPLA right now, um, of of those right statements to actually um, to actually illustrate um, some of those broad numbers that I've just been talking about. So here's an image. Um, we actually know quite a bit about. Um, we know that uh, we know the creator here. We know the date created. Um, um, one of the things that um, we we know. Um, one of the things that we see here in the rights field is, uh, again, that, that this digital image copyright, um, digital image copyright 2010. Um, the 2010 is, is clearly not the date that it was created. Um, it was the date that it was scanned. Um, we also see a lot of contact information, and, and we see an all rights reserve statement as well as the image copyright, um, and then we see for more information, contact, and we've got an address and a URL to contact. Um, but the resources out there actually tell us um, that um, in this particular case, um, the life of the author plus 70 years for this is any work for an author who died before 1946 is actually in the public domain in the U.S. as of January 1st of this year. Um, if you don't know about this chart, this is a chart that Peter Hurdle maintains. Um, the URL is, is below here on the slides. Um, this is a great chart that um, I've used for, for many years, and I'm, I'm sure many of you listening have as well. Um, but in this case, again, we know the creator. One of the things we do know um, is that this creator did die before 1946, um, but yet this, this particular institution is claiming a new copyright because they have placed it on the scanner and pressed a button. Um, there's nothing transformational about placing an object on a scanner and pressing a button. Um, it should not get a new copyright. Um, the copyright, the right statements here, the right statement here um, all things considering saying this was an unpublished work, um, that if this truly is an unpublished work, the right statement should actually say um, that this item is in the public domain. So there's there's a bit of, um, of that, of kind of this digital image copyright um, that some of our institutions have practiced through the years that will be part of um, what we try to correct as we begin to label things with right statements. Um, here's another example of a right statement in the Digital Public Library of America. Um, I pulled this one for a number of reasons. <laughs> um, one, one of the reasons is, um, is, is I think this statement is a tad bit confusing. Um, another reason is this is an example of why the right statements field uh, has so many, is the, is the uh, longest field in the DPLA, because this one is a great example of, of, of a very long right statement. But if I came to this statement as a user, I see a date created of 1904, um, and then I get down to the right statement and it says public domain. That's the first thing it says. But then it says release under a Creative Com Commons by attribution license. So they want a CC by license, um, and they want you to credit both the University of Southern California and the California Historical Society as the source. And then it goes on to give some contact information. So we're, we're giving a little bit of um, some, some conflicting information here in this right statement, um, and so hopefully our goal in, in creating rightstatements.org and some standardized right statements is that we're actually able to communicate better to users um, more about the right status itself. So our friends at Europeana um, had developed a right statement, um, kind of a licensing framework for their, um, for their partners, so like DPLA, Europeana has been working to aggregate um, data from cultural heritage partners for a number of years. They're about five years um, uh, older than DPLA, so they've been around for quite a while. Um, and they took uh, several years to actually build a rights framework, build a licensing framework. And the, the items I actually have over here on the right, the public domain mark, the out of copyright, non-commercial, reuse this, all of those are um, what they were using as part of um, 
their standardized statements for their partners to choose from. Um, so that, that was in use by the Euro, Europeana network. Um, their, their goal was to um, work with their network to, um, to make this, um, to make the, these labels um, used, used by all the network. Um, and they started with a different situation than DPLA started with. So we started from the beginning requiring a right statement. So we only have 7% of the statements um, without a right statement at this point. Um, Europeana, in contrast, actually started with 54% um, unlabeled. 27% um, all rights reserved, 3% Creative Commons license, and 15% um, labeled as public domain. And then you can see how it transitioned over time as they worked with their network to educate them about their licensing framework. So they did a lot of workshops and they educated them about the framework and what to um, when to apply what license or when to apply what statement and um, you'll see how that changed over time. Um, they went from having 54% unmarked, so no right statement at all, with and to in and by 2014 they were able to have all of their statements um, completely marked. Yeah, that's fortunately a problem that we don't have. Um, that said, sometimes going from uh, maybe unmarked to an actual statement may be, may be somewhat easier than having to figure out a confusing statement and try to translate that to a more standardized statement. But this was the Europeana um, case um, and, and how they've transitioned over time. One of the key things that you're actually actually able to do um, when you have standardized labels is that you're able to facet by copyright. Um, I think this shows the power of possibility around standardization of these statements. Um, so our users could search, this is just a search in Europeana for Chicago. At this point I could then um, go in and, and further facet, further limit by copyright status. Um, if I only wanted to see things in the public domain, I could choose that public domain mark and see those 54 items that are marked in the public domain. Um, so this will really, I think, help our users be able to know what they can and cannot do uh, with items that they find online instead of maybe getting a confusing statement. So we talked with Europeana quite a bit about, um, about their licensing framework and um, the need to basically build a framework that wasn't country specific but that was extensible to many countries um, and we, we decided to get together and start building that framework and that's how writestatements.org developed um, and we also involved in a consultant capacity um, the folks at Creative Commons um, We'll, we'll talk throughout uh, this webinar that there, there are some key differences in right statements and Creative Commons. Creative Commons are actually licenses and right statements are just that. They're statements that talk about access and reuse, but they're statements, not actual licenses. Um, Creative Commons licenses should actually be assigned by the rights holder um, and statements can be assigned by institutions who are not necessarily the rights holder at all. Um, they're just statements that actually um, you know, give information about the um, access and, and use of those materials that we find. So we recently launched writestatements.org. Um, you can certainly go, down, go there now um, or go there after this webinar is over. Um, we announced the launch of it at uh, DPLA Fest recently, um, just just back um, a couple of weeks ago um, in April, and um, have have already had a lot of uh, I think community chatter and um, interest about um, these these statements. So the goal of WriteStatements.org, um, it is a joint project intended to provide standardized write statements for aggregators and our partners. Um, it can certainly be implemented by others, but we had aggregators in mind when we created this. Um, statements have guiding principles, and they fall into three categories, and Greg's going to talk to you about that a little bit. 
The statements themselves are expressed as URIs in compliance with linked data best practices. And if you really want to dive into why we decided what the background was and what led us to actually create writestatements.org and some of the guiding principles behind the statements themselves, you can certainly read the white papers on the writestatements.org website. There's a, web, there's a white paper on the statements themselves and there's one on the technical framework as well. So I'm just going to illustrate a few possibilities as, as to what the DPLA network. Um, I showed you some of the possibilities on the um, some of what already exists on the Europeana site, but here is is a mock-up of, of what what things might look like for DPLA. Um, so here's a uh, can I use it facet. Um, so taking the right statements and putting them into categories. Um, so the, the, the public domain materials, um, maybe the Creative Commons materials and a few others might go into the yes category. Um, some others would be yes with some restrictions. Um, um, or you can use this only for non-commercial or educational use and maybe the status is unknown regarding reuse. So this is an example of how we might be able to facet materials in a, in a kind of um, user-friendly language, if you will, we can categorize these different statements and put them in um, these kinds of categories. Another way we can do this is by the actual statement themselves. Um, so we're going to dive in later as to what the actual statements are, but here's a brief example of just to break down by the right statements themselves. So um, if, if something has the URI for the end copyright statement, um, you would you would be able to um, facet by that. It may also have the URI for the no copyright United States statement um, and you'd be able to see what those are. So you could be able to see items that are in the public domain in the United States um, and be able to facet by the actual statement itself. Um, another way is when you actually get to the results page, being able to see kind of if you see underneath this thumbnail image, um, this says um, non-commercial use only. So each of the um, each of the right statements themselves have a corresponding icon um, logo that that goes with them, and so um, we'll, we'll likely be using those in the DPLA portal to express visually um, the right statements the right statement itself along with the rights field where we re well we will express that um, with the URI so um, before I turn things over to Greg to kind of dive a little bit deeper um, into um, copyright and, and the law kind of behind this and and what drove us I just wanted to uh, make sure that I give credit to the to the folks that really have worked on this. Um, so I had the fortune of, of co-chairing this um, this working group that built rightstatements.org uh, with Paul Keller from Europeana who works at Kenneth Land um, and um, many other wonderful folks. So I'm not going to read all the names, but um, Mark Monianzo at DPLA really kind of led the technical work and building that technical infrastructure to make those URIs work. Um, Dave Hansen, Greg Cram, um, Melissa Levine in particular um, really hammered out the statements themselves. Um, and then here are a number of other folks who worked on the project, um, who worked tirelessly um, for the past couple of years to make uh, this project happen in the background. Um, took us a lot longer than we thought to launch rightstatements.org, but um, international collaboration always has its challenges. Um, and I just wanted to also say that uh, this project is graciously funded by the Knight Foundation and um, we are, we are very thankful for their support. This was a winner of a Night News Challenge grant um, and we've been, uh, been working on that for, um, for right at two years now. So um, without further ado, I think I'll hand it over to Greg. Great, thanks Emily. So uh, while we're getting the slides moved over, I just wanted to, uh, to echo something that Emily said. You know, this took some hard work on our part, and, and the reason why it took such a long time is getting from 100,000 statements um, down to 12 statements um, really took us uh, uh, took some effort. And because we're walk, working cross borders, it really uh, involved a lot of kind of different uh, 
uh, issues and, and different conversations um, to get there. Um, Emily, can you just make me the presenter? There we go, perfect. Okay, so standardizing these write statements was is really critical uh, and really important to improving the user experience that Emily was talking about. Um, but how do you know which statements to apply? Wh which statements do you do you apply to each of the items that you're contributing to DPLA? Um, answering that question requires a basic understanding of copyright law. So we're going to spend the rest of this webinar laying out the basic foundation of copyright law that's particularly relevant to applying the statements that we're talking about. We're also going to talk about the basics of contract law and the rules and how those contracts change the, the defaults um, set forth by copyright law. And we're going to go into this detail, this level of detail in copyright law, because accuracy matters here. We want statements that are applied correctly and are user-friendly, that are they're actually work for our users. So as we go through this workshop, think about the resources you might need to implement these kind of statements in a way that gets us the, the, the most accurate statements. We know that not every institution is going to have dedicated resources to apply these right statements, so think about what your institution will need to implement these things. This program will be the foundation from which you can begin your efforts to apply the correct right statements uh, to the digital assets shared with DPLA. But as we go through this, think about what, what would really help you uh, get these statements applied to your data. And if you're a DPLA hub, feel free to include those uh, in the, the chat message. Um, call out ideas that might, uh, DPLA might be able to help with to get you and your institution to apply these statements. So before we start uh, down the copyright background in earnest, I, kinda, I wanted to preview the statements for you so you can get a sense of what the, the statements are. Um, so there are, as Emily said, there are three kind of rights categories that these statements fit into. And we're going to be spending the next workshop, workshop uh, talking through these statements in depth. But I wanted to introduce you at the beginning of this to kind of help set some context for you. So the first grouping, the first main category of rights statements are in copyrights. So in this category, you'll find the basic in copyright statement, a couple of orphan works statements, a few statements where the institution applying the statement has secured permission from the rights holder to allow others to make specific kinds of uses, um, uses like educational uses or non-commercial uses. Um, so this category is really the in-copyright side of, of the house. The next category of statements is the no-copyright statements, or the public domain statements. In this category, you won't find a basic public domain statement, and we'll talk about why in just a minute. But you will find no-copyright United States and flavors of no-copyright, but uh, where other kinds of restrictions might apply and might restrict the, the use of the, the digital asset. Finally, the last category is undetermined or other. In this category, you'll find statements that provide less information about the copyright status of the item, in part because we may be missing some information. So these statements, uh, this group, this category, includes statements like no known copyrights and not evaluated. Soon, there will be a, a third statement in this category that is undetermined. And in fact, everyone uh, in, in the Right Statements Project uh, is, has agreed to this in principle, and so this statement will be added soon. It's not on the website today, but it will be shortly. So these statements, these Right Statements that we've developed, these 11 or 12 statements, it will be 12 soon, um, are meant to work in tandem with Creative Commons. So as Emily said, Creative Commons are licenses that are applied by a rights holder. In most cases, it's not the institution who's making the item available who can apply the Creative Commons license, but instead they can note pass that Creative Commons license along if the rights holder has designated it with such a license. So the Creative Commons licenses fit within the, within the overall plan here, um, and they are statements that would be accepted by DPLA as valid right statements. So as you're planning out what, what right statements to use, and you have certain assets in your collections that have been assigned a Creative Commons statement by the rights holder, those statements would be valid for DPLA. Uh, well, there's even some public domain tools from Creative Commons, and even these tools will be accepted as valid right statements. 
We'll talk next more in the next workshop about the differences between the public domain mark and the other no copyright flavors that are in the right statements pool. But for now, you should know that the CC0 and the public domain uh, mark tools are eligible to be included in the DPLA right statement field. So here's what a statement actually looks like. This is a URI for that statement. Um, just like a Creative Commons license, each of these right statements will be expressed as a URI on rightstatements.org, and they'll both be human readable and machine readable. And as Emily said, this is kind of a best practice, especially when we talked about linked data. And the reason why we want to make sure these are compliant with linked data is because they open up a number of possibilities, not just the possibilities that Emily demonstrated, which are allowing you to facet on a web page, but it really it truly allows you to build a web of material that has been assigned a certain right statement, and you can start to facet on that in a larger context. Okay, so before we get into the copyright section of this, I just want to tell you kind of who I am and what, what I do. So I am the Associate Director of Copyright and Information Policy at the New York Public Library. I've uh, been working here for just over five years at this point. Um, and the number one question that I get is, with a title that long, what does that actually mean? What does your title actually mean? Um, and that's always a good question. There's about 45 of us who do what I do at libraries. Um, there's only one of us, though, that works at a public library uh, like mine. So I am the copyright person at NYPL, affectionately called the copyright nerd at NYPL. I'm also licensed to practice law, um, although I don't report to the council's office at the New York Public Library. My, my job has two main priorities. The first is to expand access, both in our physical spaces and in our digital spaces. I work with curators to increase access to our collections as broadly as possible. My second priority, my second job, is don't get sued and lose. That's my second priority. And, and we do that in order. Um, those things are set exactly how they should be. My first priority is to, is to expand access as broadly as possible. And my second job is just don't get sued and lose that copyright lawsuit. Kind of a third priority for me lately has, uh, has been activity in Washington, D.C. and even in uh, New York State Capitol. So because copyright is so fundamental to what we do, I'm increasingly finding myself engaged in copyright policy conversations, especially now that Congress has undertook, undertaken a review of copyright law. A few years ago, I testified before Congress on behalf of NYPL about copyright issues and the first sale doctrine, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Okay, so let's get into the copyright essentials. So right before we get into it, though, I should remind you that nothing you hear in this webinar or in the next session should be considered or construed as legal advice. If you'd like legal advice for your particular situation, I suggest you talk to your local legal counsel or, or hire uh, engage legal counsel. Um, and now that that disclaimer is out of the way, uh, we can get into it. So the first question I have for you uh, is to think about whether you've created a work protected by copyright law today. So have you protected, created a work protected by copyright, light, copyright law today? For those of you who are nodding your head yes, that you have, great. Um, but for those of you who are nodding your head no or not sure, um, I've got another question for you. Um, did you do any of these things in the last 24 hours? Did you write a Facebook post? Did you shoot a Vine video, write an email, draw a doodle, take a photograph, write a paper? If you did any of those things, then you created a work protected by copyright law and you should have been nodding your head on the first question. And that's in part because copyright is everywhere. It has a direct impact on your work at a cultural heritage institution. And on a daily basis, you're likely to interact with copyright law more often than any other federal law. That's because we create works that are automatically protected by copyright every day. We also use works that are protected by copyright law every day. But despite its pervasiveness in our daily lives, we're not always well versed in copyright law. Um, it's something that, that we touch every day, but it's something that we don't necessarily understand as well as we, as we could or should. So I'm going to walk through some basics uh, on copyright law, and then we'll talk about contract law, and, and then we'll wrap up for, for this session. 
Um, but let's walk through the copyright law. So where does copyright law come from? Uh, it's the foundation of copyright law comes from the Constitution. The Constitution gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries. So uh, Congress has the power to pass laws to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So why do we have copyright? Well, there's lots of theories, but one of the most basic theory, one of the most fundamental theories is that copyright law is a means to an end. We reward authors and creators with a limited period of exclusivity and control to incentivize the creation of new works. It's really an economic argument. We want to uh, enable authors and creators to create works by giving them power uh, to control how those works are used, at least for a certain amount of time. This is kind of a different theory than in the European countries where the purpose is slightly different. It's important, uh, in those countries, it's important that they recognize and celebrate authorship of works and the protection of those works um, and they view it as a moral or fundamental human right. And this difference in the foundation of our copyright laws explains why, in part, European copyright law is so different or is different than U.S. law. So the ends here, in U.S. law at least, are the creation of new works so that we can all learn from each other. In fact, we know that's kind of the, the reason why we have copyright law, because the founders uh, named the first Copyright Act an act for the encouragement of learning. In other words, we want knowledge to be made available so that we can all learn from that knowledge. It allows society to gain new insights, and after the period of exclusivity is over, reuse that expression and permit unlimited copying. And by allowing for unlimited copying, we spread ideas widely, broadly, and deeply. So let's walk through some basics of copyright law. So you've likely uh, encountered a notice like this, a copyright notice like this, in the items in your collections. Um, this notice says copyright 2016 by Greg Cram. Uh, that's me. And we're going to use this statement as kind of a point of reference for us, a touchstone to, for us to come back to um, when we move through these sections of copyright law. So the first thing is the copyright symbol. So we're going to start with that. So what is protected by copyright law? And what rights do you get if you are the owner uh, of a copyright? So let's start with what does copyright protect? And often I've learned that it's easier to flip this question around. Um, instead of asking what does copyright protect, ask it the other way and say what does copyright not protect? Because copyright, doesn't, copyright law doesn't protect ideas, procedures, processes, systems, method of operations, concepts, principles, or discoveries. Those things may be protected by other aspects of, of law, a patent, trademark, a trade secrets, for example, but they're not protected by federal copyright law. Instead, federal copyright law protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Again, that's original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So original, so let's break this down a little bit. What are original works? Uh, what are, what's an original work of authorship? Well, what it, means to, what it means to be original is to have some modicum of creativity. It's gotta have some basic fundamental element of creativity to be an original work of authorship. So take for example, uh, the information in phone books. The information in phone books is not original, they're all facts. And therefore, there is no copyright in the data of phone books. However, there is a very thin copyright in the way that the book is laid out, the facts are laid out. Um, so copyright could protect whatever creative expression is, is uh, included in the layout, design, color, or kind of anything else that's original in a phone book. And for the most part, in phone books at least, that's really thin. There's, there's a very small, very slight copyright in that. And there's certainly uh, no copyright in the factual information in the phone book. <clears throat> in 1999, we also learned something about what kind of photography is protected by copyright law. So uh, a court in uh, just downtown from where I'm sitting today um, said that elements of originality may include posing the subjects, 
lighting, angle, the selection of film and camera, evoking the desired expression, and almost any other variant involved. But according to the court, slavish copying, although doubtless requiring technical skill and effort, does not qualify for copyright protection. Again, slavish copying, although requiring lots of technical skill, doesn't qualify for copyright law. In other words, although the photography staff in NYPL's digital imaging unit bring years of experience, care, and professionalism to their work, their goal at the end of the day is to take photographs that accurately represent and reflect the two-dimensional items uh, in our collections. And when we take those photos, uh, those photos are, uh, they, they don't create new rights for NYPL. NYPL doesn't assert new rights in its digital photography, and that's because the court has told us that there is no new copyright in that, those kind of slavish, accurate reproductions of the originals. Emily's already shown you this, this slide, um, but unfortunately DPLA is replete with examples of institutions trying to assert a new copyright in their photography of two-dimensional objects. For example, this partner is, is, this contributor is claiming a new copyright from 2010 on their fo photograph of an item that appears to be in the public domain. And Emily's kind of already walked you through why this item appears to be in the public domain, um, but they, they are asserting a brand new right in it. And that is some, for some reason, uh, for, for essentially is taking away the public domain. It's removing and reducing the public domain, even though that statement's likely um, um, not true. Okay, so it has to be original and it has to be uh, fixed. It has to be sufficiently permanent and fixed. Uh, aha, that's why my slides are off. Okay, so it has to be sufficient, it has to be original, it has to be fixed. It has to be sufficiently permanent or stable um, uh, to be qualified for copyright law. So, uh, things like chiseling in stone, clearly protected by, uh, are clearly fixed, right? Those things are, are clearly um, uh, protected or are clearly uh, fixed in a way that's perceivable to humans. So that's the easy example of what fixed are. Um, but also things like writing. So uh, writing uh, on a whiteboard is clearly a fixation of, of, those, uh, of that work. Oh, and I now just lost my slides again. Okay. Uh, also, uh, courts have told us that things created on computers are also sufficiently fixed for copyright purposes. So therefore, things stored in RAM are, are protected by copyright law. And ultimately, copyright protects a, a number of things. It protects books, it protects fine art, music, movies. But ultimately, the format doesn't matter here. It doesn't matter because it, copyright protects original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Okay, so if you've created something protected by copyright law, then you get a set of rights. Uh, you get a, a set of rights that, that all rights holders get, and we call those rights a set of exclusive monopoly rights. These rights are often referred to as a bundle of rights. So here's my bundle of rights. And it's the right to do something and prevent others from doing something. So take, for example, uh, uh, the, the first right that you get is the right to create copies. So only the rights holder can create copies of their copyrighted works uh, and make reproductions of those things. Rights holders also have the exclusive right to create derivatives. So for example, uh, on the left, you've got the book, The Hunger Games, and on the right, you've got the derivative work, which is the movie. Um, the movie had to have cleared rights with the, the book um, to, to create the derivative film. Uh, you also have the right to distribute your copies. So in this case, uh, you, you as the rights holder have the exclusive right to make your copies available and distribute those copies um, uh, to, to the public. And last, the last set of rights you have are the right to publicly reform or display works. So uh, in this case, this is out in the back of the, of the New York Public Library at 42nd and 5th Avenue. Um, and every summer we have a, a film festival, or the Bryant Park has a film festival. And at that film festival, the films are publicly displayed uh, and performed. And so therefore, the producers, the, the organizers of the event had to clear rights um, with, those, with the film producers. 
So again, the rights that you get are the rights to make copies, the rights to make derivative works, the right to distribute copies, and the rights to publicly perform and publicly display those works. Okay, but these rights are balanced. Uh, these rights are balanced against a set of exceptions and limitations um, that, that, limit, that, that permit users to lawfully use works without the permission of rights holders. For example, although the rights holder has the exclusive right to distribute their work, once they've distributed a particular copy, that copy can be resold by someone else without permission. So the rights holder has the exclusive right to distribute their work, but that right is exhausted, that right uh, ends once that work has been, that particular copy has been distributed. And that's because we want to support um, and, and we believe in the value of secondary markets. So this, this doctrine, this limited, this limitation, this exception limitation is called the first sale doctrine. And first sale is critical to secondary markets. It's the reason why we have eBay and Abe Books and Goodwill. And even uh, for a fleeting moment, I guess the, the record stores, the used record stores that are still out there. Um, but we also have libraries, right? Libraries take advantage of the first sale doctrine every day. When we lend a book, that is a distribution of that book, and but for the first sale doctrine, we might be running into infringements uh, of the, those exclusive rights. So that's the first sale doctrine. That's one example of an exception and limitation. Um, the second example of a, an exception and limitation is the, the libraries and archives exceptions. So in recognition of the important work and special role libraries play in society, Congress gave libraries a special set of exceptions. The key, uh, these, are, these exceptions are key to library services. Um, libraries do things like copying for preservation, um, copying in response to patron requests, making copies and computers and printers available to our users and even printing or permitting some very broad uses of older orphaned works. Um, these exceptions are really important and, and uh, for libraries, if you don't know your 108 exceptions, um, you should try to get, look into it and, and try to understand what they are. The last uh, exception that I want to, or the second to last exception that I want to cover is the, the Chafee Amendment in section 121. This is another exception that's designed to help combat the book famine our readers who are blind or print disabled face. And this exception was added in 1996 um, to permit authorized entities like public libraries to produce or distribute copies of works in specialized formats for the exclusive use of readers who are blind or print disabled. So there's an exception in copyright law that allows libraries like mine to make copies and create uh, copies of in, in specialized formats for the use of our readers who are blind or print disabled. And we can do that without the permission of rights holders. And that's another exception in the law. And the last exception that I want to cover, at least for today, is fair use. So unlike other exceptions, fair use uh, is, is kind of the dominant force right now in copyright law. Um, fair use plays a critical role in balancing the rights of rights holders with the interests of users. Fair use plays a critical role to make sure copyright law doesn't abridge the freedom of speech, and that's why it's played such an important role today. Um, I'm going to walk briefly through the four factors and walk through an example, but we're going to spend more time on fair use in the next session um, coming up uh, in a week or so. So there are four factors in fair use. Um, the first factor is the purpose and character of the use. Are you using the work, the copyrighted work, for commercial purposes? Are you using it for non-profit educational uses? Are your uses transformative? Are they changing the nature and changing the purpose of what the uh, work, the original work was created for? If so, then your use will tend to uh, find towards a finding of fair use. The second factor in fair use is the nature of the copyrighted work. Is the copyrighted work that you're using highly creative? Is it unpublished? Is it not so creative? Is it really, is it, I have a really thin copyright like the, the format and layout of a phone book? Um, answering those questions helps you understand whether this factor tends toward a finding of fair use or away from a finding of fair use. The third factor is the amount used. So how much of the original of the copyrighted work did you use? Did you use all of it? 
was your use of all of it appropriate for the purposes that you made? And that's the purposes we discussed in the first factor. So how much of the copyrighted work did you use? And is that use uh, appropriate? Did you use the heart of the work? If you use the most important bits from the work, then it's likely that those works are not, uh, that your use uh, may not be fined toward a finding of fair use. Instead, it may find a way from fair use. The last factor is the market impact. So if your use is permitted to happen and happen broadly by other people, what's the impact on the, of, of your use on the market for the original? Are you harming the market for the original? Are you changing how the marketplace will work? And are, are there licensing options out there that would help you, uh, that, that you by making the use that you're using would destroy those licensing markets? All right, so that's a lot of theory. So let's walk into uh, what fair use actually looks like in practice. Um, so this is a portrait of Demi Moore while she was seven months pregnant. And the photographer is Annie Leibovitz, an internationally recognized photographer. She took John Lennon and Yoko, the John Lennon of Yoko Ono portrait many years ago. And she published this photo in uh, Vanity Fair in August of 1991. And I'm sure by now you've seen this photo or versions of this photo used many, many times since then, but this was the first. And when this photo was taken and photo was published, it was instantly acclaimed and became part of the cultural zeitgeist. Um, so much so that Paramount Studios uh, took it. Uh, so much so that in 1993, as part of its advertising campaign for Naked Gun 33 and a third, the final insult, uh, Paramount created this, this poster. And so here are the two photos next to each other. So in this case, Annie Leibovitz sued claiming copyright infringements. She said that Paramount took all of the protectable elements, uh, or took most of the protectable elements, and therefore is infringing her right, her exclusive rights. Paramount instead uh, claimed that this use is protected by fair use, that its copy of the photo was a parody. And they said the parody is important to the free exchange of ideas and criticisms, and therefore shouldn't be barred by copyright. And ultimately, the judge in this case agreed. Uh, the judge said this is a fair use, and the judge balanced uh, the, the rights of authors and the interests of authors in protecting their exclusive rights to their works against free speech. Uh, we'll talk more about fair use in the next session, especially as it relates to orphan works. But for now, I just want to leave you with that sense of a fair use uh, protects a number of different kinds of uses, especially those um, that are transformative. So let's go back to our, uh, our copyright notice. So this statement is telling you uh, not only that is the work in copyright, or that I believe the work is in copyright, but that I am the owner of this work. Uh, I am the owner of the work this statement is attached to. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about copyright ownership. And we'll start here. And we'll start with two examples. This is a uh, Vincent Van Gogh hanging at the Mo Museum of Modern Art in New York. And uh, the question for you is, does MoMA own the copyright now that it owns the physical painting? So does MoMA own the copyright now that it is acquired and owns the physical painting? And the answer is no, they don't. Physical ownership doesn't equal copyright ownership. Just because you own the physical item doesn't mean you now are the copyright holder um, by, by necessity. We'll talk later in this session about how you might have acquired both the rights to the physical object and also the, the copyright to the object um, through a deed of gift or some other accession agreement later, but the default is that physical ownership doesn't equal copyright ownership. Uh, let me show you another example. So this is Mary Pickford. Um, she was an actress and one of the founders of the Motion Picture Academy. So she's writing a letter in this example. Um, and so the question is, does she own the copyright in the letter or does the receiver? So she's going to mail the letter off to her friend. Does the friend now own the copyright in this or does she, does Mary? And the answer is that she does because a copyright in a, in a work invests initially in the author or authors of the work. And you can send your physical copies away uh, to, the, to the four corners of the world, but still own a copyright 
in the work. You, you don't actually have to have a copy in your hands to, uh, to retain copyright ownership of it. So for example, if I uh, scribbled on a piece of paper today, I had some creative expression, it was a doodle, whatever, and I threw it away and you came by my office and grabbed it um, and then republished it maybe 30 years from now, um, me, hopefully me, not my estate, but um, hopefully one of us will, uh, will be able to tell you to either stop doing that or maybe we'll be able to grant you a license. But you don't own the copyright in that work, I would. So in this example, Mary is the sole copyright owner of the work. She's the sole author of the work. And therefore, the, the copyright notice in this case would be copyright Mary Pickford um, because she's the sole author in the work. Let's talk about a little bit of a harder example. Um, so if I have Mary Pickford and John Philip Sousa writing a book together called uh, Music and Film, uh, the question is who owns the rights in the, in the book? And the first question, or, or uh, from a fake interview that I just created, um, let's say they, they uh, have, uh, let's say they say this in their interview. So there have been times when we've woven our thoughts from paragraph to paragraph, sentence to sentence, word to word, so tightly that even we don't know who wrote what anymore. In this situation where we have two authors trying to join their work, um, we have something called a joint work. That's a work prepared by two or more authors with the intention that their contributions be merged into inseparable or interdependent parts of a unitary whole. Um, so each can license the work, uh, the whole work in a non-exclusive way. All they have to do um, is if they do license in a non-exclusive way to someone else without the authorization or, uh, or knowing of the other rights holder, they just need to account for them or account to them later. If they want to license that, that book exclusively to a publisher, then both of them need to agree to it, um, and both then can account for any royalties or profits. They, they can split those evenly or however they choose to split them. So in this case, uh, the copyright notice is copyright by Mary Pickford and John Philip Sousa because they're both authors in the same work. So copyright 2016 by Mary Pickford and John Philip Sousa. All right, let's ramp it up just a little bit more. The harder part uh, is when we have multiple authors. Um, what if we've got multiple authors who are contributing articles that they wrote into a book? And in this case, there's no intention to merge uh, their works into inseparable or interdependent parts. Instead, all they're doing is contributing their individual titles. Um, they're contributing their own titles to a overall book. And let's say the book is The Cutting Edge Collected Works of Today's Leaders, arranged by Thomas Billings. So if we have got multiple authors contributing articles to a book, in this case, then we've got a collective work where each of the authors retains their own individual rights in their copyrighted works. Um, the, the owner, the arranger of this book, Thomas Billings in this case, um, would own a copyright in the overall arrangement and selection for the book, but each of the individual rights holders own uh, a, a right in their own copy, in their own uh, work, and they don't own rights in any of the other works contributed for the, uh, for the, app, for the book. So in this case, we have uh, three separate copyrights for all three articles that have been contributed to this book. Plus, we may even have a fourth copyright notice for the, the arranger of the book. One more situation. So if Mary is writing a memo on behalf of her company, uh, then we're dealing with something called a work made for hire. Works prepared in the course of employment or works uh, are works are I'm sorry, are works made for hire. And in this case, the initial owner of a copyright um, when a, there's a work prepared as a work made for hire um, is not Mary. Mary is not the, the rights holder in this work made for hire. Instead, the rights holder is her employer, and in this case, Michael Scott. Um, in a work made for hire, the employer is the author, is considered the author and the copyright owner. So in this case, uh, we have a, a copyright notice that says 2016 by the Acme Company, which is her employer. 
So that's important as we think through uh, what's in our collections as cultural heritage institutions. So often we acquire the papers of, of, uh, of organizations. And as we do that, it's important to note uh, for, for bibliographic reasons who wrote those things. But for a copyright purpose, it's also important to understand whether the rights holder is the, is the company or whether this was an independent work that was created outside the scope of employment and therefore not owned by, by the, co by the uh, company whose records you have. Okay, so now we've got authors covered. So we've got joint authors, we've got sole authors, we've got uh, collective works, and we've got works made for hire. But who else can own a copyright? If the author gets the copyright at the beginning, who else can own that copyright um, going forward? And the answer to that is that heirs can. Uh, so, so there are, are uh, heirs to an estate, and copyright can be transferred to those heirs by means of, of conveyance or operation of law. So take, for example, right now, the Prince issue. Um, so Prince apparently died without a will. Um, so his copyrights, his valuable rights, um, especially those rights in the unpublished works that haven't uh, apparently been released yet, uh, those are really valuable rights. So there's going to be a, a dispute between the estate um, over who owns those rights, because those rights can be transferred down to heirs by, by convey, conveyance or operation of law. Another uh, group who can own rights is actually institutions. Institutions and companies can own rights. Um, they're not individuals, they're not authors, but they can own copyrights. So the New York Public Library, for example, owns a number of copyrights in the works that are, uh, we've collected over the years because we've been able to have uh, assignments from our, uh, from our rights holders. So in this case, the copyright notice would be uh, copyright the New York Public Library. So overall, uh, IP copyrights can be transferred just like personal property. Assignments uh, in these cases, though, need to be made in writing and signed to be effective, but they are effectively and, and can be transferred just like personal property can. With the harder issues that we get into is when we have layers of rights. So uh, copyrights can be layered in works. So for example, in music, there are usually Two, at least two copyrights involved. The first is the sound recording, so that's on the right on your screen, uh, and the second is the music underlying the performance, the composition. So when you hear uh, Some Nights by Fun, uh, what you're hearing is, uh, is at least two copyrights being used at the same time. So there's the copyright in the sound recording and the performance of the music, and the second is the underlying score, the, the, the notes on the page. And in both cases, when you use, want to use a sound recording, um, you need to clear or you need, uh, if you're using, thing, using that sound recording in ways that are beyond the scope of expect exceptions and limitations, you need to clear both the composers and the, the copyright in the sound recording. Um, that becomes more complex, especially as we start to uh, even subdivide lyrics from notes um, or we start adding samples to the sound recordings. Even more complex are films. Uh, so films can have many layers of rights, um, especially when we're talking about documentary films or other kinds of uh, films that have lots of third-party content in them um, that live in our collections. So these can be really, really complex, and moving image material in particular have, have caused uh, some, some really tough issues for, for libraries to, to get through, libraries and cultural heritage institutions who don't own rights in those films. Um, but this layer of rights can also uh, be in place and even in books. So for example, in, this, uh, in, in a book, you can have illustrations. And those illustrations may not be necessarily done by the rights holder of the text of the book. Instead, they may be licensed in, or they may have an arrangement, or, or maybe even a work made for hire for the, the actual images that you see in the book. So even books with inserts can have many layers of rights. Okay, so let's talk about duration. So how long does copyright last? Well, today, copyright lasts for the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. So lifetime of the author plus 70 years. 
Um, there's a, a couple of exceptions to that when we're talking about works made for hire, but in general, when we're dealing with most works, it's life of the author plus 70 years today. But this has changed over time. It hasn't always been life of the author plus 70. In fact, uh, I should, in 1790, on the first, during the first Copyright Act, the duration of copyright protection was 14 years after publication. That's it, 14 years after publication. Um, authors could apply, or rights holders could apply for another 14 years of protection, but they would actually have to do some work. They'd have to file the renewal with the Copyright Office and therefore uh, get that extra 14 years, and that's it. So at, at the most, rights holders got 28 years of exclusivity from the date of publication. Clearly that's grown over time, and in 1976 we shifted from a publication um, kind of regime where the publication date started the clock to life of the author plus 50, or ultimately life of the author plus 70. And that's in part because we joined a, uh, an international treaty um, that called the Berne Convention, where we needed to change from a publication status to a life plus status in order to, to comply with the, the terms of the treaty. Uh, and I should note that duration is not consistent across the world. In fact, there's no worldwide copyright law. Although we have a Berne Treaty, Berne Convention, um, that treaty relies on a patchwork of individual countries' laws. We'll talk more about U.S. duration in the next session, um, but it's important to note that, that duration worldwide is different. Um, in some countries, it's life of the author plus 100. Others, it's life of the author plus 50. But generally, it's life of the author plus something. So once copyright has expired, once this period of exclusivity has expired, then anyone is free to make any use of the, of the bundle of rights that we talked about earlier. Works whose copyrights have expired are called public domain works, and those public domain works can be used by anyone. They can be copied, they can be distributed, um, they can be, they, derivatives can be created of them, etc. but those works can, are all um, public domain works and therefore can be used widely. Um, things like projects like the Project Gutenberg, which have identified public domain works, are in fact, were, were in fact, or are in fact, hand keying those books to create ebooks up for them and distribute those ebooks. Because those works are in the public domain, there's no uh, infringement here. Speaking of infringement, uh, what happens when someone infringes these exclusive rights? In other words, what happens when you violate one of the rights, one of the set of exclusive monopoly rights reserved for the rights holder? Well, if there's an infringement, there's a few different remedies available for a rights holder. The first remedy is monetary damages in the amount of lost earnings. Uh, and there's some important questions for cultural heritage institutions to think about when we're talking about monetary damages that are based in lost earnings. So uh, as you're using a work or you're potentially using a work, um, think about whether the work was previously commercially exploited. Is there a market or potential market for that work now? Is the work associated with an individual or organization that might have a financial, reputational, or competitive interest in restricting access or use? Um, that's kind of the Disney example, right? Uh, a Disney who has a, a, non, a not otherwise previously commercial, uh, commercially exploited work, something kind of in their archives, uh, may be big enough of an institution to have an interest in restricting access or use of that material. Um, also think about what the, uh, what the profits are. So think about all that money you and DPRA are making off of your collections. Oh wait, that's right, you're not, right? So, so the actual risk exposure here is likely to be low in many situations that we commonly encounter. So the first remedy, the remedy to, to have money damages for the amount of lost earnings uh, for most situations in libraries is likely pretty low. The real concern, though, is if the work is registered, then we have a second option. The rights holders have a second option, and that's statutory damages. Uh, so under statutory damages, uh, infringements uh, start at $30,000 per work infringed. And in the worst case, uh, when it's a willful infringement, it's $150,000 per work infringed. That's the, that's, those are the damages available to a rights holder. I should note, again though, if a library, archives, or educational institution infringes these rights, 
but a judge concludes that they had a reasonable belief that their use was a fair use, then the judge can remit damages. They can, he can say, he or she can say, um, no damages are due here. There was a, a reasonable belief that their use was a fair use, and therefore no damages are available. The last option, uh, the last remedy available to rights holders is to seek an injunction to stop the user from using the copyrighted work. And again, this is a, a, a harder thing to get now, especially after some recent um, decisions that, that held that, uh, that encourage judges not to take on this extreme remedy, um, especially when there's an interest, the public interest, in leaving this material up before it gets uh, uh, taken down. There's also been some recent scholarship on the number of copyright lawsuits brought against libraries and archives. Um, and although I threw out some really scary numbers for you, uh, in the last five years, only 1,100 cases have been filed involving a defendant with a, a name uh, or a variation of library or archives in its name. So five years, we've had 1,100 lawsuits. But in those 1,100 lawsuits, only 13%, only 1% of those suits were designated as copyright infringement lawsuits. So of all the things libraries and archives get sued for, you know, employment issues, slip and falls, et cetera, only 1% of those lawsuits, only 13 lawsuits in the last 15 or five years um, were actually copyright lawsuits. All right, so that ends the, the copyright side of this. Um, now I want to talk about, copy, or, uh, uh, talk about contract essentials. Um, so we're going to get into con contractual issues and, and talk about how uh, contracts change the, the defaults set by copyright law. So we, we spent the last 30 minutes or so discussing, 40 minutes discussing copyright law, and that serves as kind of the ground rules, the default set of rules that we're going to work with. But those rules can be changed between parties. Um, those rules can be changed when there's a contract in place. So uh, there's, there's two columns here. There's the copyright side and the contract side. Um, under the copyright side, the copyright lays out the default rules. Contracts can modify those default rules. Um, on the copyright side, the only uses permitted are those defined by exceptions and limitations in the law and when, when works fall into the public domain. On the contract side, though, uh, we can create additional permissions. We can create allow additional uses of the material or we can add additional restrictions to that material. We can limit the way those things, those works can be used um, and kind of use it uh, without, uh, beyond the defaults of law. In copyright law, the, the, the defaults here are set uh, and are uniform and they're done that way by necessity. So when you get into a copyright situation, you know what the default rules are. But in contract law, there is no uniformity um, unless there's some intentionality. There's some intention to make sure that your uses, that, that your contracts are uniform. So we'll talk about the implications of that in a second, but I want to walk through some just basic licensing issues. So as Emily said at the beginning, only rights holders can grant licenses. You've got to be a rights holder to grant a license, to grant people permission to use your work in ways beyond those uh, laid out in the copyright law. And those changes, the, these licenses change the default rules to allow additional uses. And there are no magic words needed here. You only need an indication of intent. So it's not like every single license that we ever get is a very formalized document, you know, notarized, et cetera. That doesn't happen. What often happens is we get licenses in the form of emails um, or, or in the form of letters or hopefully in the form, uh, more formal form of agreements. But to be honest, what often happens is that we get licenses through email and that's okay. Um, we would like to have something a little more in depth, a little more in writing um, to, to beef up our argument that our uses are protected by that license. But in any case, there's no magic set of words that trigger that say this is a license. So you may have dealt with a couple of different forms of licenses. Um, the first one is a deed to gift. Um, you, a deed to gift is a formal legal agreement that transfers ownership of and legal status, legal rights in the materials to be donated. So it sets out the exceptions between the donor and the institution, the expectations between the donor and the institution. So if something goes wrong, uh, there's, there's, clear, uh, there's a clear 
layout of what the responsibilities are of the parties, and so everyone knows what's, what's going to happen, and we can hopefully avoid some of those surprises. In these deeds of gift, if the donor is the rights holder, then the donor can add a license into the deed of gift that allows the institution who's taking on the physical materials to make additional uses. And often libraries uh, like NYPL or other libraries um, at the time of acquisition seek these licenses from the rights holders. But the key here is to make sure that the person who's signing the deed of gift, the person who's donating the material, is actually the, the rights holder. For examples of Deeds of Gift, uh, ARL published a special issue in June of 2012 that has some model Deeds of Gift that dealt with permissions or copyright assignments. Um, this is the June 2012 RLI, and it has some really good model Deeds of Gift um, that talk about and that deal with how rights can be assigned or other kinds of licensing arrangements. So the typical components that we see in a license, again, there's no magic words, but the typical things that we like to see in a license um, are who can make the uses. So if we're going to add additional uses uh, on top of those already granted to us by copyright law, who can make those uses? What types of uses are covered here? Are educational uses permitted? Are they limited to non-commercial uses? Or is there no restriction on use? You as a library can use it any way you want. Um, we also see things like uh, duration. So how long is this contract good for? How long is this agreement or this license good for? Ideally, we'd like to see licenses that are uh, good for the term of the, of the copyright. We want, uh, ideally, we want to do this deal once. We want to make this license once, and that's it. But that doesn't always happen. Um, we're often asked to sign licenses that are five years or ten years, um, et cetera. We also want to know how much. How much is this license going to cost us? Ideally, we're looking for gratis licenses, right? We, we are all nonprofit institutions, or most of us are, and all of us have budget concerns. So how do we, how do we deal with uh, how much a license is going to cost? Luckily, most rights holders, uh, when we get to them, are, are very willing to uh, grant us certain rights and do so uh, gratis or, or without a fee, a royalty-free license. Uh, and another component that we typically see in a license is limiting it, or maybe not, to specific geographic regions. So sometimes we'll see licenses that permit us to make uses in English-speaking countries, um, or in all countries, or maybe only in North America, um, or maybe only even in the United States. And in all those cases, we try to uh, try to expand those limits as much as we can, and we try not to have as much of a territorial limit but that's not always the case, and it's, a, it's kind of a point of leverage in these agreements. The last typical thing you see in a, in a license is what happens if something goes wrong. So what happens if, if the worst, uh, something, if, if, uh, if you do something that's, that's outside your license, what happens to you, or what, what's going to happen next? Um, and those kinds of saving provisions are there. Sometimes you'll see indemnity language, Sometimes you'll, you'll see kind of mediation requirements. You'll see lots of different things. Okay, another license that you may be uh, encountering are Creative Commons licenses that are applied by the rights holder. Again, we've talked about Creative Commons a number of times here, um, but there's, this is a form of licenses that you will encounter as you, uh, in your careers. So there are a few variants of these licenses tailored to the overall goals of the rights holder. So the rights holder selects which license they want to apply, and that license and applies downstream. So for example, rights holders can choose to permit only non-commercial uses. They can choose to exclude commercial uses um, or require people who want to use them for commercial purposes to contact them. Rights, holder, rights holders can also apply a Creative Commons license that prevents derivative works from being created. Um, so for example, if you wrote a book and you don't want it to be converted into a movie without your permission, you can create a, have a no derivatives uh, restriction on your license. The good thing about Creative Commons is they don't have to be individually negotiated. Uh, they, once the rights holder applies the license, then that work is subject to that license uh, forever, so long as the rights holder, or so long as a user, finds a copy of it with the license attached to it. 
So if the donor is the, is the rights holder, some cultural heritage institutions are asking the donor to assign a Creative Commons license instead of asking for a narrow, non-exclusive license that only the institution can use. And the benefit to asking your rights holders to apply Creative Commons licenses is it allows many downstream users, our users, to use those works without seeking further permission. Um, institutions like Hadi Trust have, have uh, really pushed this. They've, they've been seeking or have been accepting uh, requests from rights holders to make their works more broadly available by assigning a Creative Commons license to it. And Hadi in Michigan have been able to make those things more broadly available. There's even a variant of a, that's not really a license from, from Creative Commons, but is instead a waiver of rights. And that's CC0, otherwise known as the public domain dedication. And for those of you who are DPLA hubs or DPLA partners, you know about CC0 because all of the metadata we contribute to DPLA is done so under a CC0 dedication. Now there's some discussion, there was some discussion at the time that CC0 was adopted by DPLA, um, whether CC0 was even necessary. As we said at the beginning, copyright doesn't protect factual information. Um, but, but the DPLA board decided to resolve any kind of questions about, uh, about the copyright status of those things by applying a CC0 dedication to the extent that anything is protected by copyright law. And DPLA did that to, to really encourage the reuse of the data and clear away any of the copyright concerns that people may have in using that data. Uh, institutions like Harvard and NYPL have also been using the CC0 dedication to waive rights in whatever rights they have in their bibliographic metadata. Uh, the, the other side of permissions are restrictions. So sometimes there's deeds of gift that contain odd donor restrictions. For example, I've seen deeds of gift, uh, proposed deeds of gift at least, that allow only those users with a bona fide and verified scholarly purpose to view the collections. Um, I've also seen deeds of gift that allow people to photograph the collection only if the donor specifically signs off on it. And so that means the institution has to prevent people from taking photographs of, their collect, of, of that particular collection, usually by having it sit at a separate table and it's just not a good way to go. I've even seen an institution acquire the copyright in material from the donor only to voluntarily agree to allow a sole individual associated with the rights holder to sign off on any and all future uses of that material if there are any kinds of sound uh, audio issues or if there's a question about the standard of audio in, in being used there. So in other words, if the audio is not perfect, the, the institution, although they own the copyright, have voluntarily agreed to go to that individual person to, to sign off on our, their use. We've also seen restrictions creeping in when a third party is digitizing collection items. So when cultural heritage institutions partner with others, those digitization partners may request that the institution not make certain uses of digital images. For example, in exchange uh, with Google to digitize books in their collections, many institutions agreed not to make certain uses of those books, even if those books are in the public domain and free of all copyright restrictions. Some institutions agreed that, that they, they would restrict their uses of materials, public domain materials, for a certain amount of time in exchange for Google uh, volunteering to digitize that material. Of course, we try to avoid that at all costs, but in some situations, it may be the only way content can be digitized. Of course, the goal here is to limit those restrictions as narrowly as possible and for as short a duration as possible. We don't want those things sticking around for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, then the, the value in the digitization kind of is diminished. So while permissions can only come from rights holders, restrictions can be added by anyone in ways that restrict your use if you agree to them. So that means you need to be careful. It means you need to watch how you, how you license material because anyone you contract with uh, could potentially restrict the way that you use your collections. Sometimes contract license, uh, neg contracts and license negotiations feel like a tug of war. And if you're going to give in on some things, make sure you have a good reason to do so. Congress gave you these exceptions and limitations, these fundamental baselines in copyright law, 
and far too often we give up those exceptions and limitations in exchange for not much. Um, and, and that's not a great way to go, especially as we're considering and trying to make more and more of our material available. If you are ever in a position to review a license and don't understand what the license says, the Lib License site is a great starting point. There's plenty of resources online to help, but Lib License is the first place um, I recommend going. So if you're going to give up those uses permitted by the Copyright Act, you should know what you're getting in exchange and understand the terms uh, being used. Finally, my final piece of advice is that uh, you need to keep a copy of any agreement that you sign. Your institution likely has a document retention policy that will tell you for how long you need to keep the document, but a really good practice is to keep agreements and licenses and restrictions for as long as they are active. So for as long as they are apply, you should keep those things. In many cases, especially for licenses, that may be for a very long time. Remember, it's life of the author plus 70, so we may be holding on to licenses for 100 years or so. Um, I, at NYPL, we've reviewed Deeds of Gift from the founding of the library, and, at that, and that's over 100 years from now, or 100 years ago. And those documents, some of those documents are still in effect today and still have something to say. All right, so that wraps up my part of this. I, I just want to highlight a few things that we're going to talk about next time in the next session. Um, in the next session, we're going to spend some time talking through the public domain in the United States and how works published after 1923 might actually still be, uh, or might actually be in the public domain. So works published after 23 might actually be in the public domain in the United States. We'll also discuss uh, how our conversations today about contracts play into and influence the flavors of the no copyright and in copyright statements that are out there. We'll talk about how when uh, there's a restriction or a permission that goes, it's different than fundamental copyright law, how that can be reflected on a rights statement. We'll then walk through some actual examples of collection items and discuss which rights statements might apply to those situations. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll give you a heads up now that, that there are, there are and oftentimes there are multiple answers that could be right, and we try to get this as accurate as we can, but there are in some situations uh, answers that are more than just one. And we'll also talk about the, the broader implementation plan for DPLA and even highlight the implementation plan um, for, for some of our partners who are considering using these statements. Um, in particular, I'll highlight how NYPL is intending to implement these statements on our website. So that's it for me. I'll hand this back over to Emily and Kenny. Um, if there are specific topics you'd like to highlight, uh, you'd like us to highlight in the next session, please feel free to add your comments in the box, and we'll we'll try to approach as many of those as we can um, in the next session.